Given the centrality of Darwinism to the debate over intelligent design, one would expect Professor Ayala to marshal a powerful array of evidential arguments in support of the power of random mutation and natural selection to generate biological complexity. But did you notice that all of the arguments that he presented in his opening speech were not arguments in favor of Darwinism, but rather were arguments in favor of the thesis of common ancestry? It's the same in his books. I've searched Professor Ayala's writings looking for scientific evidence of the power of random mutation and natural selection to produce biological complexity and have come away almost empty-handed. For example, he appeals to the experience of breeders in producing new varieties of, say, roses or dogs. But such experience obviously does nothing to justify the extrapolation of these mechanisms to the production of macroevolutionary change. Indeed, quite the contrary, the experience of breeders tends to show the limits of these mechanisms. Professor Ayala also appeals to the old chestnut of the peppered moth experiments. But all that happened in that case was that the proportion of light-colored moths in the population decreased and the proportion of dark-colored moths increased. Light-colored moths never evolved into dark-colored moths. Taken as evidence of the power of natural selection and random mutation to produce macroevolutionary change, honestly, to call such evidence paltry would be to pay it an undue compliment. Finally, Professor Ayala appeals to the ability of organisms to develop resistance to drugs and poisons through random mutation and selection. He points out how an unacceptably improbable double mutation can occur one step at a time to produce cumulative change. He then extrapolates the process to explain macroevolutionary change. But of course the question is precisely, can the example be extrapolated in that way? In his most recent book, The Edge of Evolution, Michael Behe argues that the very evidence of organisms' development of drug resistance is a powerful indication of the limits of random mutation and natural selection to produce evolutionary change. For example, malaria and the human immune system have been waging war against each other for over 10,000 years. Since the advent of modern medicine, human beings have been developing anti-malarial drugs to destroy the bacterium. Unfortunately for us, the malarial population is huge. The average person infected with malaria has over one trillion malarial cells in his body. Therefore, malaria mutates extremely rapidly and so has been able to develop resistance to every drug we've hurled at it. Simple, single-point mutations are enough to make malaria drug-resistant. For example, a mutation in one amino acid at point 108 suffices to render malaria drug-resistant to pyrimethamine. On the other side, there's enormous selective pressure for the human immune system to develop some sort of defense against malaria, but it hasn't done so. Instead, what's happened is that a mutation has occurred in the human respiratory system which makes some people immune to malaria, namely sickle cell hemoglobin. Unfortunately, the downside is that it also produces sickle cell anemia, which is eventually deadly. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Despite its incredible mutation rate, which has enabled malaria to overcome every drug we've thrown at it, malaria has never in all those thousands of years and trillions of mutations been able to overcome sickle hemoglobin. Molecular biology explains why. Resistance to a drug can result from a simple single point mutation, but overcoming sickle hemoglobin would require multiple simultaneous mutations or else a sequence of mutations occurring blindly and both are just too improbable to occur. HIV, 
provides another case study. It mutates 10,000 times faster than malaria. In the last 50 years alone, the AIDS virus has mutated as much as all the cells that have ever existed upon the Earth. It has tried out every possible combination of up to six point simultaneous mutations and has become resistant to every drug we've developed. But, Behe says, through all that, there have been no significant basic biochemical changes in the virus at all. On a functional biochemical level, the virus has been a complete stick in the mud. Behe concludes that the studies of malaria and HIV provide by far the best direct evidence we have of what Darwinism can do. He says here we have genetic studies over thousands upon thousands of generations of trillions and trillions of organisms and little of biochemical significance to show for it. Our experience with HIV and malaria gives good reason, he says, to think that Darwinism doesn't do much. Even with billions of years and all the cells in the world at its disposal. Thus, Professor Ayala's argument from drug resistance appears to completely backfire, far from providing evidence of the power of the Darwinian mechanisms to produce macroevolutionary change. Our experience with drug resistance in bacteria and viruses reveals the severe limits of those mechanisms. So, again, I ask where is the evidence? for Professor Ayala's extraordinary extrapolation. Michael Behe says that the evidence for common descent seems compelling, but except at life's periphery, the evidence for a pivotal role for random mutation is terrible. Now, if he's wrong about this, then let us hear the evidence. I'm genuinely open to it. Just tell us what it is. <laughs> 